Good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Jennifer Cooley, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the State Historical Museum. During 2021, the State Historical Society is commemorating the upcoming 175th anniversary of Iowa statehood. In March, which is Iowa History Month, the Iowa History 101 webinar series expands to every Tuesday and Thursday. You can learn more about this series and all of our programs on our website at iowaculture.gov. Please remember to sign up for each webinar you would like to attend. And don't worry if you can't watch live, all presentations will be recorded. Today, we will look at the relationship between class, gender, and region in urban uprisings in the Midwest, the central dif differences between the 1960s and the millennial revolts, and how these historical lessons can bring about change today. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker. Everyone came into this webinar on mute with cameras off. Closed captions are available by clicking the closed caption button on your screen. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in a few days. I have disabled the chat function, but if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. My colleague Matt Beyer is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. But please note, we may not be able to get to all of the questions. Now I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Ashley Howard. Ashley received her PhD in history from the University of Illinois. She joined the University of Iowa faculty in fall of 2019, coming from Loyola University in New Orleans. Her research interests include African Americans in the Midwest, the intersection between race, class, and gender, and the global history of racial violence. Her manuscript on which today's presentation is based is Prairie Fires, Class, Gender, and regional intersections in the 1960s urban rebellions, which analyzes the 1960s urban rebellions in the Midwest, grounded in the way that race, class, gender, and region played critical and overlapping roles in defining resistance to radicalized oppression. Ashley's work has appeared in Real News Network, The Black Scholar, No Jargon Podcast, The Chronicle of Higher Education, BBC Mundo, Al Jazeera, the Associated Press, and NPR. And now I'm very happy to turn it over to Ashley to begin the webinar. Hello, everyone. First, I'd like to give a big, big thank you uh, to Jennifer Cooley and the State Historical Society of Iowa for inviting me here today. It's a great pleasure to speak to you. And although we are far apart from one another, it's a good day to be inside, as I, I imagine it's raining most places where you are. And I'd also like to give an even bigger shout out to Anissa Castle uh, for opening up her beautiful space for me at the African American Museum of Iowa, which is where I'm giving this lecture for you today. So on March 3rd, 1968, former Alabama Governor George Wallace arrived at Omaha's Epley Airfield in a chartered plane. The Omaha Police Department estimated that over 1,500 people had gathered to either welcome or denounce Wallace. Both groups vigorously pumped signs in the air, ranging from Wallace go home to welcome to Nebraska. From anarchy in the streets is from racism in the states to we conservatives must stick together. Clearly Omaha had two very distinct opinions of Wallace. While speaking to a class at the University of Omaha, Wallace shared his feelings about the so-called pseudo intellectuals protesting outside saying quote if i get to be president and one of these anarchists lay down in front of my car it will be the last one he lays under and a boisterous applause followed that night nebraska voters helped wallace's american party become a third political party in the state at 6 30 an hour before his scheduled speech began protesters began marching in front of Omaha's Civic Auditorium with signs. As the youth and Catholic nuns chanted, we want freedom, send Wallace home, signs bobbed up and down on the picket line proclaiming racism is unchristian, white fascism, pseudo intellectuals of the world unite, Wallaceness is lawlessness, black is back, and my personal favorite, Wallace is a putz. <laughs> 
organized by the civil rights activists, including several local priests, black Creighton University students, and area high school kids. What, could ha what occurred next could only be described as a police-induced riot, as organizer Father Jack McCaslin called it. Officers dressed in black shirts led the high school protesters who were marching outside into the auditorium to a reserved section immediately adjacent to the stage where Wallace was set to speak. When the adult marchers came up to the entrance, the police told the chaperones that the reserve section was full and then directed them to leave the group of young people and sit all the way up in the balcony far away from the unaccompanied minors. And although the Civic Auditorium only had 1,400 seats, over 5,400 people were crammed inside. The students, unsupervised, began sitting in the front, tearing apart their protest signs and throwing them on stage. These students were sandwiched between pro, the pro-Wallace crowd and what was known as Wallace's goon squad, including plainclothes Omaha police officers, and thus they were sitting ducks. When Wallace gave the signal, it's people like you, and pointed down at the youth, the melee began. Police officers sprayed the young activists with mace, and the protesters had to rush out of the hall and rinse their eyes. The police forced the protesters to run from the front of the auditorium down the center aisle and across the back to the rear side exit. The running students were, quote, beaten out of the auditorium, end quote, with steel folding chairs. The sp spectators witnessed a black girl being kicked by two white males, a black boy on his hands and knees being hit with a chair by an older man, and a Wallace supporter holding a young black man while a police officer struck him. Two white student observers felt that the incident, quote, was precipitated by a lack of rational and perceptive forethought on the part of the Omaha police, end quote. Shortly after 10 p.m. that night, the first reports of groups gathering near 24th and Lake Streets in the black neighborhood of Omaha began to be reported. By 10.32 p.m., broken windows were reported and people engaged in widespread property violence or an uprising for the next several days. An interviewer from the Omaha World Herald reported that the junior at, Civil, at Central High School, a young woman by the name of Joanne Donaldson, was one of those protesters beaten out of the Civic Auditorium. And she was quoted in the article saying, you're gonna get it, baby, just you wait. Nebraska's gonna be a ball of fire this summer. It's gonna be the hottest summer, the hottest state there is. That evening, this Midwestern city did not have to wait for summer as young men and women strategically looted, vandalized, and set fire to symbols of white and capitalist oppression in the black community. Now, I like to begin with this kind of opening story because it helps us to reframe our traditional understandings of the rebellions. First off, it's eerily reminiscent to much of what we've seen take place the last year. It focuses on an unexpected Midwestern locale it challenges assumptions that only males participated, and it shows that uprisings occurred concurrently with the so-called right way to protest. But it also helps us to begin to think about the ways that urban rebellions can be manipulated by different entities for their own gain. So in my forthcoming book, I argue that the urban rebellions of the 1960s were not simply spontaneous acts of violence, but instead were a form of gendered, working class black community protest. But today, in the limited time we have, I would like to focus on two specific frames for analysis, gender and region. And I focus on these two main reasons for, you know, or I focus on these two main categories for two main reasons, see the parallels there. First of all, they are woefully understudied. Um, so oftentimes people forget that the Midwest had these uprisings. And the second is that it's critical to understand the ways in which gender and region play out for us to understand our current history that is unfolding before our very eyes. 
So after grounding ourselves with a broad overview of the 1960s uprisings, I will then utilize gender and region as a category of analysis historically before then thinking about the ways that these two categories matter for the history unfolding before our very eyes. So that's a lot of stuff to get through. Let's go. So what are the urban rebellions? Commonly thought as riots, but they're also known as civil disturbances, uprisings, and insurrections. Between 1965 and 1968, over 300 urban rebellions took place across the country, resulting in nearly 300 deaths, 60,000 arrests, and hundreds of millions of dollars in property loss. These events had several common features. First, we often see a police incident as catalyst. This may be excessive use of force. This may be a moment of police brutality. This could be a moment of a killing, right? So police are usually at the center of the first initial act. But we also see that long held grievances are also a primary cause. Concerns about economics, about housing, about schools, about political enfranchisement. All of these things also weigh heavily on the minds of participants. These incidents usually escalate in stages. So you have kind of people milling in the streets to begin with, which then escalates to rock and bottle throwing, which then leads to window breaking. And once those windows are broken, looting often occurs. And as the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, what's better known as the Kerner Commission wrote, quote, the civil disorders of 1967 involved Negroes acting against local symbols of white American society, authority, and property in Negro neighborhoods rather than against white persons, end quote. So this is a really important distinction that I think that gets lost in the 50 year sets. This idea that the 1960s uprisings were about hurting white people as opposed to property damage. Another element that's often forget, forgotten is that these are political events. Most cities and participants have a period of negotiation where they talk about, you know, uh, in effect, a ceasefire, so to speak, and what the city will give the participants in exchange, right? Listening to their grievances, listening for the reasons that they're out in the streets and ways to make it better. We also see that white power structures and youth establish African-American civil rights leadership and militants or some combination therein are all acting to define and to make sense of these moments politically. Who is participating is another really important uh, aspect because we're going to see people participating at the intersection of their identities. So the typical participant, not saying everybody, but typical participant was a teenager or a young adult, a lifelong resident of the uprising city, right? So these aren't people coming in to make trouble. These are folks who live there. They are better educated than their non-rioting neighbor and they're either underemployed or unemployed. But most key to this is that they have a strong black consciousness. As the Kerner Commission wrote, he was proud of his race extremely hostile to both whites and middle-class Negroes, and although informed about politics, highly distrustful of the political system, right? And so while, you know, the Kerner Commission came out in April of 1968, just a few days before King's assassination, right? So already at this time, there's this knowledge that there's something more than just race going on, but people choose to ignore that there are more complex reasons that people go out into the street. And this is where these intersectional identities come into play. Now we'll talk about gender at length later in the presentation, but I do wanna offer a few brief remarks, um, you know, really due to our time constraints here about the importance of class and how participants engage with the urban rebellions. So, First of all, class, particularly in the African-American context, is a really muddy concept. What does it mean to be upper class or middle class when glass ceilings due to racial discrimination is a major factor in the upward mobility of black people? Similarly with racial redlining, 
what does it mean when black people can only buy houses regardless of their income in certain neighborhoods? So we see those kind of defining characteristics of class having to be thought about a bit differently in the black context than in kind of a mainstream white American context. And while race has been featured as the central category of analysis for the urban rebellions, this frame of class and its salience has really been ignored, right? So again, like Kerner Commission said, they're hostile to both white and middle-class Negroes, end quote, right? So there's this intra-class, or excuse me, intra-racial class tension going on. And our kind of collective um, forgetting of the importance of class also helps us forget the long history of violence as working class politics, not only in this nation, but globally, right? And so that allows these events, these urban rebellions to be read as, you know, aberrant, as just anti-social violence, instead of being rooted in a long-standing tradition of violence as protest for working class people. And so whenever I kind of teach this, I love using this political cartoon, right? Because it's just so evocative of many of these intra-racial um, you know, issues. And if we were all together, I'd make you do a little of this work, but you know, you came to see me, so I suppose I'll do my job. But on the on the right, right, you see this black middle class family. And you can tell that they're middle class by their clothes, right? He's wearing a collared shirt. The little girl has a, you know, bobby socks and a neat bow in her hair. The wife has a very stylish Jackie O pillbox hat and her heels, right? They're a unit. You see women aligning themselves with men as mothers, as wives, and really living up to these middle class ideals and respectability politics. The working class man, right, who's wearing just a t-shirt, um, he's filling Molotov cocktails, and he's literally being looked down upon by the middle class family and pointing him out and his, you know, misactions. And so I think this is kind of the context in which many Black American, uh, working class Americans are finding themselves at this kind of mid-century or mid-60s uh, moment. And, you know, the middle class man is saying, you mean to say this is a solution to our problem? But really, the word that needs to be kind of underlined and bolded here is our problem. Even though we have glass ceilings, even though we have racial segregation in housing, how does class help mediate some of the tensions and the struggles caused by racism? And so this is to say, when the man, the middle-class man says our, who is our in his imagining? Because the working-class man sees himself as a different person than just kind of this homogenous black mass. So due to their class positions, white collar and blue collar African-Americans experience discrimination differently. As Malcolm X noted, quote, when you have two different people, one sitting on a hot stove, one sitting on the warm stove, the one sitting on the warm stove thinks progress is being made. He's more patient, but the one who is sitting on the hot stove, you can't let him up fast enough. He continues, quote, you have the so-called Negro in this country, the upper-class Negro, or the so-called high-class Negro, or as E. Franklin Frazier calls them, the black bourgeoisie. They aren't suffering the extreme pain that the masses of the black people are. And it is the masses of the black people today, I think you'll find, who are the most impatient, the most angry, because they are the ones who are suffering the most. Right? So if we think of this kind of long trajectory or this long continuum of different types of pro, um, protest actions, whether this be letter writing campaigns, whether this be sit-ins, whether this be don't work where you can't buy or other types of boycotts, those are all very slow moving um, tactics. Whereas we see with the urban uprisings, there is rapid response to these actions. You know, almost overnight, we see people in communities, at least at the beginning of the 1960s, 
who participate in urban uprisings get job employment centers, get teenage um, pro recreational programs, get all of these types of new playground equipment, get all of these things that they are presenting in their grievances to those in power within days of the uprising. So this is a very, very powerful mechanism for change. Although there is, you know, this property of diminishing return. Over time, it becomes less of a powerful mechanism for change. And working class people know this because they have seen it in action. And again, it ties to this long history um, in the vein of Rude and Hobsbawm and Tilly, you know, all these historians who are looking at white working class protests in the Europe. And so in the case of the Midwest, really class and region are acting as co-conspirators in the black experience. As you can see from this map, most of the states in the United States, with the exception of the Mountain West, had some sort of urban rebellion during the late 1960s. Yet these events are most prominently associated with large coastal urban areas like Watts and Newark. And when people talk about Detroit, right, another deadly and costly uprising, they excise Detroit from the Midwest, right? That's just an urban center and forget that it takes place in the Midwest. Between 1967 and 1971, the Lemberg Center for the Study of Violence at Brandeis University tabulated that 29.9% or a total of 173 discrete instances and 29%, a total number of 168 discrete instances of uprisings occurred from 1967 to 1971 in the Northeast and Midwest respectively. Meaning that in the aggregate, the Midwest, right, where there is a smaller black population and fewer urban centers had just five fewer uprisings than the population dense Northeast. More tellingly, in 1967, the year in which the most uprisings occurred, 50% of major disorders, 33% of serious disorders, and 36% of minor disorders took place in the Midwest region. In 1967 alone, 80% of the uprisings for a total of 128 took place in cities with a population under 500,000 people. Places like Des Moines, which experienced an uprising in 1966, and Waterloo, which experienced an uprising in 1968. So what is the Midwest? At first glance, when defining the Midwest, one may wish to evoke the method Justice Potter Stewart used in his concurring opinion of hardcore pornography in Jacobilis versus Ohio in 1964, right? I know it when I see it. And if you want to get into a really great debate, discussion, throw down, ask somebody in Cleveland if they think they're part of the Midwest. Ask somebody in uh, Detroit or Omaha what they think are the boundaries of the Midwest are, and you will get as many answers as you have people you ask. But I propose a way of thinking about, a met, about the Midwest that goes beyond just what the federal government tells us, right? So the federal government likes to draw the Midwest or the North Central region, which is kind of arbitrarily connected to the state boundaries of portions of the Louisiana Purchase and the old Northwest ordinance. However, I believe that we can get to the mindset and the real, the culture, political, a social demographic of the Midwest in more savvy ways. In the identity of the American Midwest, historian Andrew Caton articulates the difficulty in defining the Midwest, quote, since the burden of life in the Midwest has been to deny any kind of difference, the whole notion of asserting a unique or peculiar configuration of people and environment contradicts its unarticulated sense of regional identity. Meaning the Midwest under understands itself as having no difference. 
as being homogenous and that to assert a unique or peculiarity about itself would in fact undercut or undermine this regional identity. And so I exploit this denial of difference that Caton describes to demonstrate how white Midwesterners mobilize these feelings of sameness, of flatness, of homogeneity to erase and blame black people for the significant disparities between black and white Midwestern life. The first of these characteristics was a decline in principal industries in the Midwest, a process that disproportionately affected African-Americans. So when we think about the Rust Belt, when we think of the mechanization and the deindustrialization that America found itself in the clutches of in the 1970s and 1980s, this is happening in the Midwest in the early 1960s, particularly around agricultural industries, which they're stopping to put, um, say like meat packing and a centralized location in cities. They're outsourcing it using horizontal structures in small towns. Um, so this is having an impact on the economics of the Midwest and some places begin to switch, right? So you see Chicago moving to a customer service based economy. You see other places diversify with insurance um, or other types of white collar industry. Well, African-Americans who had long been undereducated and underemployed, right, no longer have these technical skills to get into these good, high paying, white collar types of jobs. And then when certain industries close, they're making a point to educate white workers with new skills, but black workers don't have access to those same opportunities. So they're once again, either unemployed or underemployed. The second kind of characteristic of the Midwest is that although African-Americans enjoyed a higher standard of living than say the South or Northeast, the standard was still considerably less than their white regional counterparts, right? So this is this notion of not only rising expectation, right? People are leaving the South, coming to the North, looking for a better life, but also the feelings of relative disadvantage. When looking at their white peers, they see they don't have the same access to education, the same access um, to quality housing, the same access to political power. So this is a tension that we see uh, here as well in the Midwest. The third, and with the exception of a few major metropolises in which blacks consisted of a significant percentage of the population, such as Chicago, Detroit, and Cleveland, African-American Midwesterners had extremely li limited political power. And this was done by changing the processes of politics within the Midwest, be it at-large elections, be it gerrymandering, all of these different ways in which black people had the legal right to vote, but their impact as black voters was minimized. And the final contributing factor, the one that I think is really most unique and important to the Midwest, was a type of white paternalism particular to the region. This ethos lies ever present in any social, political, or economic discourse on the Midwest. More accurately, the Midwestern mentality is best understood as a myth, holding dual and entangled meanings. The first is an ideal, a dream, a promise that undergirds the expectations of what should happen. Both white and African-American Southerners came to the Midwest expecting that their hard work would be rewarded with prosperity and security, achieving the American dream. And as the rebellions revealed, this myth, right? This, if you just pull yourself up by the bootstraps, you'd get what you deserve. This myth did not align with African-Americans' reality. It is in the second, the space, right? of difference between white and black life where the second definition of myth comes to fruition. A myth is a story told to justify the conditions of the reality. In the mind of many Midwesterners, African-Americans do not work as hard as white Americans, rationalizing why prosperity and security were out of the reach. 
in this chasm between the two definitions, black and white perceptions of Midwestern life elude one another. And so I have this little cartoon here um, because when the Kerner Commission interviewed Clint Reynolds of the Cincinnati Human Relations Commission, he, he had this image on his desk and said that it was a singularly apt epigram for the organizations, right? So the Midwest was gung-ho about having some of the first human or race relation councils were started in the Midwest, but they were toothless, they were underfunded, they were over appointed with political associates. And if any of you have ever been in a meeting with like more than five people, you know you'll just talk for three hours and never get anything done. Some of these commissions had 150, 200 people in them. And so it made it impossible to get any work accomplished or to make any headway on racial issues. And that's why Charlie Brown says, we never win any ball games, but we have some inter interesting discussions. This was the kind of political roadblock that black Midwesterners found themselves at, that they couldn't vote. Middle-class um, rights organization were content with taking a slow pace and the civil rights commissions that the cities founded to bring about change weren't really interested in working to do so. So this Midwestern ideology coupled with economic hardship and white elected officials indifference to protest left African-Americans desperate for new methods to make their grievances understood. And just as class was an overlooked factor in this rebellion, in these rebellions, so too is gender. And to read the role of gender back into the rebellions, we must also look at the manifestations of manly behaviors during the uprising and not just writing women into the story. And so this, this performance of masculinity during the rebellions can be seen in three kind of behavioral categories. The first is the control of the neighborhoods in which black men were able to temporarily shift the normative po power structure, right? And you see in this picture here, which is taken in Milwaukee, um, you know, black folks are pushing back and are directly fighting the white police officers, right? So this is a taking back of kind of the normative control in the community. Uh, second, in their actions, uprising participants, both black and white, acted to protect, quote, their women and, quote, their institutions, right? So they're very much taking on this protective role in the ways that they are engaging in the uprising. And finally, uprising participants emasculated their opponents and used a masculinist rhetoric to encourage others to join them. So they're very much encouraging other people to participate on the um, desire that people need to be manly and to show that they're man, men and to show that those others are weak. Contrary to popularly held myths of non-resident African-Americans instigating rebellions, white citizens were most likely to be outside agitators. While only 3% of black male arrestees living outside of the uprising cities, almost four times as many of the white male arrestees resided outside the city experiencing the riots at the time of the arrest. Speaking this plain, this means that white people from suburban or other ex-urban communities are coming into black communities looking for a fight during the rebellions. These findings are significant because they demonstrate that many working class whites intentionally chose to aggressively participate in the urban rebellions, leaving their own neighborhoods and seeking out criminal activities in the black ghettos in an effort to, again, quote, protect their institutions. Investigators in Milwaukee found that 42% of whites arrested in the July 1967 uprisings were carrying concealed weapons. The after arrest interviews provide telling information on the extent of these white vigilantes participation. In recounting their uprising experiences, many of the black participants use the occasion to inquire about jobs or training opportunities. The majority of white arrestees use the opportunity to express their race-based anxieties. Women's participation also adhere to traditional gender roles as powerless victims, family protectors, 
helpmates, and household consumers. Often police violence against a woman served as the immediate catalyst for the revolt. Women's non-criminal support roles range from distracting police so men could avoid arrest to providing food and shelter. And in the case of Cincinnati, black nurses set up a makeshift triage center so that people injured in the uprising didn't go to the hospital, which would lead to their arrest. Women's criminal participation tended to be violent, excuse me, tended not to be violent, but rather in the context of the post-war consumer republic involving the taking and receipt of stolen goods. And women often looted the stores with predatory, predatory pricing, taking household items they weren't able to afford like laundry soap or diapers. But where the story of women is so critical to our understanding is just like the story of region and class the way that it has been flattened, ignored, and explained away, even though it has such rich explanatory power. In the aftermath of the rebellions, scholars often depoliticized and reconstructed female arrestees' participation so that these women appear to be more feminine and adherent to traditional gender norms. So much like we see in the case of region, that black people who are out in the streets are blamed for their own inequities, blamed for their own disparity between white and black life. Women, even though they are participating in non and criminal in non-criminal and criminal ways, are being explained away as accidental actors, not political agents. In a study of Milwaukee arrestees, interviewers prominently mentioned the quote feminine qualities of the interviewee and the ways in which she upheld traditional gender roles, right? You see a great example of this here on the screen. She is dressed beautifully, but she lived, the house she lived in was terrible, right? So there's this, this idea of she is succeeding in one of these kind of feminine qualities, but failing in another. Unlike the males that they interviewed, the female research assistants for this study refuse to include the political rationales for female participation. The research team sought to justify that women arrested during the uprising were merely accidental actors in the wrong place at the wrong time. As such, in the aftermath of the uprisings in those negotiation period, young black men are getting all of their grievances met. And because people don't see black women as actors, because people don't see black women of ha as having legitimate grievances, they get nothing at the end of these rebellions. The manifestations of gender once again mark significant differences between the 1960s and millennial revolts. Actions with the 1960s conflagrations can be read as black men protecting their communities and women. Rhetorically, the millennial revolts, and by millennial revolts, I really am talking about Ferguson, Milwaukee, Baltimore, not the events that happened with George Floyd's murder this summer in 2020, which I'll get a bit into in a second. Um, so these millennial revolts centered around black women's inability to protect their sons. Accordingly, the trope of black matriarchy continues to be a central focus for protests surrounding police brutality. In the 1960s, overbearing black mothers were to blame for the emasculation of black men resulting in the uprising. Today, black women are the central heroic, black mothers are the central heroic figures in recent uprisings, as well as Black Lives Matter protests. In an open letter, Sabrina Fulton wrote to Leslie McSpaden, the mothers of Trayvon Martin and Mike Brown respectively, feeling us means feeling our pain, imagining our plight as parents of slain children. Through Black mothers' activism, concerned Americans see the victims not as their assailants did, but as their mothers did. Toya Graham, pictured at the bottom, became a, or excuse me, picture in the upper left wearing the yellow shirt, 
um, became, you know, a media star for smacking her son on camera, camera and dragging him home during the Baltimore uprising. But like the lynchings which occurred throughout the 19th and 20th century, police murder is largely considered to be a male issue. Despite the efforts of hashtag say her name activists, black women continue to be erased. Their murder and sexual assault by police largely go unnoticed. Not nearly as many people can rattle off Corinne Gaines' name as readily as they can Freddie Gray. In the bottom photo, photo entitled Taking a Stand in Baton Rouge by photographer jo Jonathan Bachman, nurse and mother Aisha Evans, who was 35 at the time, is being arrested protesting the murder of Alton Sterling and also in part the shooting of Philando Castile. News coverage was mentioned throughout that it was her first protest. And according to a friend, she drove to Baton Rouge because quote, she wanted to look her son in the eyes to tell him she fought for his freedoms and rights, end quote, right? So again, this political nature of it is being read through the lens of an appropriate lens for black women, which is as mothers. And yes, black women are certainly mothers. And yes, this is a role which these women are taking in, taking on and really frames their intersectional activism. But there are also many other ways in which black women are participating in these very important movements that are being ignored. So too is region being ignored and not being complicated in these discussions. The election of Donald Trump led mainstream media to refocus on the Midwest as a site of both contestation and definition of the American character. His populist message resonated with people in the middle who felt long forgotten by coastal elites. But that very idea is read as white Midwesterners, right? What happens when we re-inscribe black Midwesterners into this narrative? The same blue collar dissatisfaction that led to this revolution in the polls in 2016 led to a revolution in the streets in 1960s. The devastation that African-Americans felt due to deindustrialization and mechanization was mainstream, right? Most Americans face this in the late 1970s and 1980s. Regional identity plays a significant role in both the cause and misremembering of these events. For African-Americans, unemployment has remained at recession levels and their wages have fallen substantially short of their white counterparts. And perhaps this is the greatest irony of the Midwestern Black experience, is that in the very moment Blacks arrived in the region seeking economic stability, the opportunities that they chased began to decline. As historian Tom Segru noted, quote, the cities of America's industrial heartland were the bellwethers of economic change, right? So this idea of the Midwest as capturing the American moment, we see play out in real time in the 70s and 80s. Inciting their own virtue in comparison to other regions, white Midwesterners ignore the subtle yet powerful ways discrimination stalled black progress. White Midwesterners built their collective self-image as industrious, resilient bootstrappers, but those black and white wage, black white wage gaps, which you see on the map image, those disrupted that narrative, unless you quote, blame blacks for their own poverty and unemployment. By politicians frequently gesturing to the region and employing coded languages such as heartland as proxy for American values, they paint the Midwest as a pastoral white meritocracy, ignoring the contributions and the very existence of the people of color who built this region. Despite the frequent boasts of their own racial progressivism, the Midwest engaged in and often developed the same racist practices the South became notorious for. It should be no surprise then that some of the most important flashpoints for civil rights, including the summer's uprisings, took place in the region. That major recent street protests grew from Midwestern soil, 
demonstrates the continued pattern of economic and political disenfranchisement in the new millennium. While Midwestern cities continue to be ranked as quote, best places to live, the black white disparity in every meaningful quality of life measurement grows larger each year. As historian and my UIowa colleague, Colin Gordon noted in his one particular index of racial inequality, the 12 states of the Midwest census region claimed eight of the bottom 10 slots and swept the bottom five. In each of these places, a seemingly liberal commitment to racial progress and an excellent quality of life occurs simultaneously with a deep practice of bolstering racist institutions, harming black and brown people. And this is evidenced by the slashing of funding for civil rights commission, right? You see across the board in the states that have these commissions, there has been significant cuts to their budgets in the past 10 years. This tension animates not only the uprisings in the Black Freedom Movement era, but also the ongoing 2020 protests. By falsely framing the Midwest as an exclusively white place without race problems, there's no issue to be managed. Resistant, resisting constant regional erasure, uprisings make Black grievances impossible to ignore. So what's changed? While racial oppression has remained constant, the shape of this discrimination mutates. While the form is new, the function remains the same, resulting in violent protests in the street. When we compare incidences of urban arrests over the past 60 years, including incidences in the intervening years, several commonalities stand out. An incident of police violence, widespread inequality, strategic pro property damage, and actions both criminal and non-criminal reflecting people's intersectional identity. But just as oppression is not identical between 1967 and 2020, neither are the forms of protests, right? We need to think about 2020 occurring in a pandemic where for months prior highlighted the significant racialized health and economic disparities. The 2020 protests were multiracial. They took place outside of black neighborhoods. And I think it's also important to note here that over 93% of these protests that took place this summer were nonviolent, right? So in thinking about kind of the grand scheme of things, this also took place in new places. While the Kerner Commission estimated that 164 uprisings took place in 1967, we see over 2,000 different American cities and over 60 different countries having protests in support of George Floyd. We also see aggressive uh, policing, particularly against journalists. And we see the role of social media, not only in capturing those images that people are taking with their cell phones, but also helping to find like-minded citizens on Facebook and Twitter. So you see teeny tiny towns having um, protests in support of George Floyd. And if part of the new American political vocabulary allows us to chant this morose list of black people whose lives were snuffed out too soon, nearly every other country can add to that tragic litany. In Israel, they marched to protest George Floyd's death and also the murder of Ayad Halak and Salomon Tekka. In France, for Adama Torore, Spain, Mame Mbaye, Mexico, Giovanni Lopez, 14-year-old Jao Pedro Matos Pinto in Brazil, Jamaica, Susan Bogle. These are global and simultaneous events. Be it in Bristol or Helsinki, Paris or Brussels, people are tying anti-Black American sentiment to their own histories of racial and colonial oppression, right? Tying the Midwest to the world. It is evident that Black Americas and particularly the Black Midwest dissatisfaction and disillusionment did not end in the era of dashikis and naturals. African Americans faced similar or worse obstacles than they did in 1967. Whereas much has changed in America since the Black Freedom Movement, glaring inequities remain. Rebellions, regardless of the era, constitute a complex beast part mirror, 
part springboard, part dirge. Violent, revol violent revolts reflect society's socioeconomic, racial, and gender disparities in the most profound way. Insurrections la launch articulate action and foment revolution. Uprisings also intone the closing of this very avenue for change as the state becomes savvier in its containing of these events. Ultimately, communal protests symbolize a taking back of power, an assertion of worth, the ultimate cry for justice and acknowledgement along the narrowest of intersectional identities. And in order to provide new solutions to decades old problems, we must have a radical rupture from these long standing inequities. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, we have a few My minutes. pleasure. Yeah, it's been great. We have a few minutes to answer some questions. Um, however, before I pose the first question, I just want to remind our participants that you can still submit your questions through the Q&A. Now, we are in a schedule, uh, so please note we may not be able to get to all the questions uh, before the end of today. So here's our first question. Uh, how does what happened this summer compare to the Capitol uprising? Oh, that's such a good question. So, I mean, first off, we're watching this kind of unfold at the as you know in real time so they're still gathering evidence and all these things that historians do but i think kind of the first thing is that there's this desire to compare the two when i think there are a lot of other great examples so even if we think of the women's march after 2016 um, that is actually a direct challenge to an unpopular political or you know presidential election that did not result result in the siege of the capital and violence. So I think, you know, when people want to make these comparisons, we need to think about kind of the political purposes that those serve. Um, but if I'm thinking about kind of like the four big things that are different, um, first of all, we saw law enforcement use greater restraint, right, of force against the protesters at the Capitol. We saw a lot of widespread pre-planning and coordination so whereas we look at George Floyd's protests and the ones in the 1960s, these tend to be um, spontaneous. Whereas if we follow the social media breadcrumbs um, after the November election, you see people are planning and really coordinating the capital siege. Um, also the intent. So this is uh, to disrupt a, you know, an election. Um, whereas the protests in the 1960s are to expand democracy. Um, and finally, this is a demonstration of power. The people who engaged at the Capitol siege held that power. And you, know, you can see it very much in the ways that they were acting and publishing, you know, live streaming these things versus you know, the 1960s and the 2020 programs, um, which is really a plea for some uh, power for a, a bit of an expansion of democracy. Thank you for that. Yeah, our next question. How and why do the different types of structural violence, like, like the Flint water crisis, need to be addressed? So, you know, one of my favorite scholars, Johan Galtung, talks about, you know, his violence triangle. And we're all kind of familiar with direct violence because this is this very, really visible type of violence. It leaves bruises, it, you know, draws blood. But what we ignore in the day-to-day -day are forms of structural and cultural violence. This is this invisible violence. So structural violence is the fact that people in America in Flint can't turn on their taps to drink their water because of lead and the long standing effect of that. Um, and so this is one of those things that, you know, people were grieving in the 2020 protests in the, 2016 protests in the 1960s program, this long standing um, inequities, this the structural violence and the cultural violence is this idea that justifies those actions, right? So people have lousy schools because, well, they don't care to go to those schools anyhow. Um, people get shot down in the street because they didn't say that, you know, they were unarmed to begin with. So it's that justification. And Gal Tung argues that you cannot disrupt direct violence unless we also radically disrupt structural and cultural violence. So if we care about you know, uprisings and we want those to stop, the place we need to intervene is in terms of structural and cultural violence. Hmm. Uh, our next question, uh, why is the Midwest overlooked in the study of involvement urban re rebellions? 
That's a complicated <laughs> question. Um, I think it it breaks apart what we think about the Midwest, right? This place of, you know, hardworking farmers who are white and Christian, you know, this kind of um, leave it to beaver type of ethos. And if we acknowledge that urban rebellions took place in the Midwest, um, it very much challenges Midwesterners opinions of ourselves. And I think it's also a factor that people just don't see the Midwest as a multicultural person place, right? I was born in Omaha. And so like when I went to college, people were shocked that black folks were in Omaha and were shocked to learn that there are civil rights movements because it challenges these convenient narratives we tell about ourselves. But I think um, the black Midwest is on the rise. They're actually out of the University of Minnesota. There's a whole black Midwestern initiative of artists and poets and sociologists and historians really working to uncover not only the history of the urban rebellions in the Midwest, but just the history of the black, black Midwest in general. And this will be our last question for time today. Um, but has the Midwestern myth and mentality, as you described it, changed over time? What would account for the change or lack thereof? I mean, I think the, the overarching mentality has largely been the same, um, but I think its focus has changed and that is largely on the changing populations in places. So whereas in the 1960s, it was more of a black white binary, not to say that Asian Americans weren't there, not to say that Latinx people weren't in the Midwest at this time, but their numbers weren't as large. And so I think the Midwestern mentality stays the same, but that cultural violence, that maneuvering, that shifting changes as it needs to be applied to different groups of people as um, these new groups come into the Midwest in larger numbers. Perfect, and with that answer, this is all the time we have for today's webinar. I think we can all agree this has been a very informative lunch. I learned a lot. Um, also, thank you to everyone joining us today. We hope everyone will sign up for the Iowa History Month webinars on Tuesdays and Thursdays in March. There are many great stories from Iowa's past to tell in the upcoming months. Now, for more information and to register for future webinars in this series, check out our website at iowaculture.gov. This webinar and past presentations are available on our website as well. And while you're there, you can look into some of our other fantastic digital programs, such as the Goldies Kids Club activities for our young historians, or watch video recordings of the Iowa Story Series, which is hosted by our Iowa City Branch. Now, thank you all again for joining us today. Have a great afternoon. Enjoy the rainy weather. We look forward to virtually seeing you here again Thursday, March 25th for our eighth Iowa History Month webinar. Thanks, everyone.